I believe we are live on Facebook, so I am going to go ahead and get started. Everybody, welcome. I'm Pitu Washte, Melissa Buffalo, Imachi Apie, Michin Chanum Yunke, Kanji Wakwa, Oyanke Na, Meskwaki Hematahan. Welcome to today's panel discussion COVID 19 impacts on cancer screenings. I'm your host, moderator, Melissa Buffalo, Chief Executive Officer with the American Indian Cancer Foundation. I am an enrolled member of the Meskwaki Nation in Iowa. I am joining you from Minnesota, land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Today, we are so honored to be talking with community experts, Dr. Rodney Herring, Dr. Marilyn Rubido, Hannah Bartel, and Kathleen Gray about the impacts on cancer screenings due to the COVID-19 pandemic across our tribal communities, both urban and rural. We will discuss where our communities are at with cancer screenings, some of the unique barriers during this time, and some of those lessons learned as we are still in a pandemic. We have about 70 minutes um, to engage in this wonderful and much needed conversation, and we'll spend about 20 minutes answering questions from attendees as well. Um, please add your questions in the chat, both in Zoom and on Facebook, um, and we'll hopefully have time to get those answered before the end of the, the panel today. Um, before we get, begin with introductions from our wonderful panelists in the chat, if you can let us know where, if you can let us know where you're joining from, and then again, as that reminder, we, uh, this um, webinar panel is being recorded, and we will house it on our YouTube page after for folks to watch. Um, we are waiting on one panelist. I'm hoping she will join us soon, but we'll go ahead and. Um, hand it over to our panelists and I will let them introduce themselves and share a little bit about their work around cancer and cancer screenings um, before we get to a presentation by Dr. Rubido and go into some questions. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Herring. Oh, I think you're on mute, Dr. Herring. <laughs> Let's try this again. Uh, Rodney Herring, I'm Seneca from the Cattaraugus Territory, the Seneca Nation of Indians, uh, which is located about 30 miles south of Buffalo, New York, uh, on the Lake Erie, just on the border of Canada and Ontario. And uh, I'm the director for the Center for Indigenous Cancer Research at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, um, and thankful and honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. Yeah, don't go. I'm Kathleen Gray from the Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma, uh, southeastern Oklahoma. We're Oklahoma City Urban Clinic. Um, we're the largest urban clinic in the country, and I'm the oncology case manager there. And uh, we take care of about 400 cancer patients, active cancer patients on our registry. So excited to be on here. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And Dr. Rubido. I'm Marilyn Rubido. I'm a radiologist who does exclusively breast imaging. And I am a member of the Iowa tribe of Kansas. So I'm somewhat related, most likely, to Melissa Buffalo. <laughs> um, and so I've I'm a professor of radiology at Michigan and, and I've been here for about 29 years and narrowed down from general radiology to breast imaging because there was, there was so much happening in breast radiology that everything else seemed a little uh, boring and slow moving compared to every, all the stuff that happens in breast all the time. And I um, married and have three children and live in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan is where I work. I also work with the American Indian Health and Family Services Clinic, which is in Detroit. I'm on the board of directors there and quite involved in all of their activities as well. And Michigan actually has uh, multiple tribes here, so there is not necessarily in exactly the area I work, but elsewhere in Michigan, opportunities to collaborate and work with many of the other Michigan tribes, which Michigan has the most tribes of any state. I think it's east of the Mississippi. So that's me. 
Thank you all for sharing a little bit about yourselves and the work that you do around the cancer continuum and with our tribal communities. Um, hopefully Hannah will be joining us soon from National Native Network and I will allow her some time to introduce herself. But Marilyn, I'll go ahead and let you share your screen and provide um, or share your PowerPoint and then we'll get into some of the questions. Okay. Uh, I hope I'm doing this right. Okay. You are screen sharing, it says. Okay. Yep, I can see your screen, so go ahead. Okay. All right. Great. Um, I'll just move this a little bit. So, this talk is about COVID 19 pandemic and cancer, but specifically um, a little bit more targeted towards breast cancer because that's what I know best and Native Americans. And I'm going to give you an update on the publications and the literature, not all of them. There are zillions of publications on COVID per se, but there are not many publications at all on American Indians and COVID-19. So this is an opportunity for publishing and presenting if any of you out there have any data or experiences that you would like to write up. There's a lot of room in the literature for this topic with regard to our communities. So um, COVID has affected uh, screening programs and preventive care, as all of you know. Let me put this down. Okay. And so, uh, for many cancers, especially breast and colorectal cancer, there have been marked delays and declines in screening, imaging, diagnosis, and getting patients the care that they need to take to deal with their cancer because of the stay-at-home orders that occurred last year. And also, not only were there stay-at-home orders, as you remember, but there then became a lot of patient fear where we were all kind of locked down and we didn't want to go anywhere and patients didn't want to go to their appointments, even if they could go to appointments. Now, a Canadian study has showed that the outcome from this lockdown has been cumulative excess deaths that will continue to occur in cancer up to maybe 2029 or beyond, they said. And this is due to the decline in screening and biopsies that has happened over the last year and a half or two years. So they expect that there will be in the future more advanced cancers and additional cancer deaths to occur and that will be tracked ongoing into the future. I referenced uh, a manuscript down here below if any of you are interested in the scientific publications that are on this topic. So this one is pretty good because it's a systemic review up to that point in time, and it was published in May of 2021, and, and it's a worldwide review as well. So that's kind of an overview of COVID and cancer deaths. So some of the recommended actions for dealing with cancer is that um, the public health messages that we give out should not just communicate the risks of COVID, but messages should also talk about the risks of delaying one's own medical care for just visiting with your physician or delaying procedures that need to happen. And very importantly, to delay screening. And really, I haven't seen any public health messages on going out and getting your screen screening done, so to speak. There should be dedicated cancer awareness programs as well now to increase public awareness and to encourage screening, as well as we can use telemedicine with patients and their doctors to communicate these things to them directly, as well as 
if there would only be advertisements on television, which we're all watching too much television. So you'd think it would be a good time for public service announcements and telling people how to take care of their health, but there hasn't seemed to have been. So uh, cancer and COVID in the USA. I was that last slide kind of dealt with worldwide COVID, and there are many publications on COVID elsewhere in the world besides the United States. If you're interested in reading about those, as you know, Italy had a huge pandemic, and there's literally COVID everywhere. So there's plenty to read about COVID in the medical literature in other countries. Anyway, um, just to put it in perspective, cancer is still more deadly than COVID, as deadly as we think COVID is. It's estimated that 606,000 Americans would die from cancer in 2020. We may know what that actual figure is since we're now in 2021, but it's not published. But that's about four times the rate of COVID deaths. There's still an awful lot of COVID deaths, if you ask me, but cancer is still way bigger in being a cause of death than is COVID. So it's more likely by far that a person would die of, co of, co sorry, of cancer than that they would die of COVID. Now, COVID-19 has interrupted all kinds of things about cancer control and cancer prevention. So screening has been interrupted. Surgeries have been put on hold. In fact, I have a good friend who has um, needed to have a mastectomy and she still hasn't gotten it done. It's been a year. Either she procrastinates it or her doctor is too busy or all of these things. So surgeries are being, are being put off. And then also chemotherapeutic regimens have been postponed because of patients not wanting to come to the hospital to get their chemotherapy. And this article uh, referencing the cancer screening challenges and opportunities is down below if any of you would like to have a look at that. Now, the monthly rate screening declines that have occurred between May and March last year as compared to 2019, which was a normal year, is that this is pretty dramatic. Breast cancer screening declined 90.8%. That's how much it declined. So that means breast cancer screening was only happening at 10% of its normal rate through March and May of 2020 as compared to the prior year. So that was at COVID's peak when nobody was coming to the hospital for anything. And then that slowly increased, screening increased a little bit, but it was still 41.8% of a decline compared to the same time period in the prior year. So that was a huge decrease in screening rates for breast cancer. Similarly, colorectal cancer uh, screening rate decreased by 79% in March and May, and then later down to an increase to 50% of its normal rate. And prostate cancer was 63% and then 35%. Prostate cancer is a little bit easier to screen for because it can just be a blood test. So whether they were just counting those blood tests or an actual clinical exam, I'm not sure. But uh, going on, despite the recovery and monthly screening rates, as you can see, the total screening deficits between January and July of 2020, as compared to 2019, were huge. 3.9 million breast cancer screenings not done, 3.8 million colorectal screenings, and 1.6 million prostate for a total screening deficit in 2020 of 9.4 million screenings not done. As a result in this manuscript that's referenced below about the cancer screening deficit in the United States, uh, public health efforts are needed to address the large cancer screening deficit associated with this pandemic. Now, as you can imagine, 
this deficit in screenings is eventually going to be um, found among us with uh, worse cancers and bigger cancers. Now, the decrease in Medicare screening, and these are the older patients who seriously need to get screened. You could argue that 40-year-olds don't need breast cancer screening as much as 60-year-olds or 70-year-olds. And to some extent, that's somewhat true because you have a lower risk of breast cancer when you're 40 than you do when you're 60. In any case, Medicare screenings were down in 2020. Mammograms were down 85%, which is pretty huge. Lung cancer screening down 75%, colon 74%, and prostate 56%. So this was for six months in 2020, and it remained diminished all throughout 2020. The pandemic and the stay-at-home orders definitely limited to access to care, receiving cancer care, and resulted in delays in diagnosis. The drops in screening may cause delayed diagnosis, which as you know, would translate into more advanced cancers and higher mortality rates in these senior citizens in this Medicare population. Now, the impact of COVID pandemic on breast cancer screening volumes and patient behaviors was measured in the state of Virginia. And um, as you know, in about March, yeah, March 2020, national organizations, including radiology organizations, such as the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, issued statements in March 2020 recommending that all screening mammography be postponed. So in March, screening dropped up to 99% as measured in Virginia. That means only one out of 100 women who were supposed to be getting their screening mammogram showed up. Um, so then after something like 18 weeks, they then reopened screening, screening centers in breast imaging for more business. So later on, screening opened up. But here's the thing, once somebody cancels their appointment and doesn't come, right, then I don't know the data on this, but a lot of people don't ever schedule the next appointment. They just say, oh, I'll wait till next year or some other time or the next year. So canceling their appointment doesn't mean that they are definitely going to be back three months later or six months later. Life is busy, right? We're all super busy with all kinds of things. And you forget. It's easy to forget or ignore medical appointments sometimes unless you're uh, really, really, really motivated. So in May of, through July of 2020, there was a lower likelihood of patients coming back for screening aid, for screening. And furthermore, this was particularly true, they found in this study that people of younger age or those living in high poverty, those having bad or no health insurance, those with long travel times, and also those who had mobile mammography were the ones who had the least probability of returning for their screenings, even after screening had opened up. Opened up. The conclusion of this article is that we need to identify as this study did, the at-risk groups and have targeted outreach to resume breast cancer screening, particularly for these types of vulnerable patients. And that article is referenced below if any one of you would like to use that for your interest or um, other talks that you might have. Now, cancer, that was uh, Virginia. Now, this is New Mexico, and this is a quote from a physician uh, there that was on the internet that was interesting. She stated that the perception among many people is still that screening can wait. Once it's postponed, then maybe it can just wait. Well, as you know, screening really can't wait. And almost a year into the pandemic, she reported that doctors were seeing cancers 
that were probably more advanced than they usually see because people had procrastinated to come back once screening opened up. Dr. Mueller, NCI Community Oncology Research Program advisor said the New Mexico Minority Underserved NCORP is a great thing because it makes cancer clinical trials accessible to the diverse population in New Mexico, including Hispanic, rural, and tribal communities with a state network. So she's in charge of a, a great network of oncology that can help people get screened. But in this program, they had a 25% decrease in cancer diagnoses, which was because of fewer people coming into their physicians and getting screened. Systems face challenges and getting the word out that it is safe to return for screenings is extremely important. And I think generally that has happened by now, but uh, we are still seeing some lags in people getting their screenings. Now this article just published by um, American Journal of Epidemiology in this last year is a really good one for those of you interested in American Indian and Alaska Native cancer issues, because it's an update of the most current data on cancers in this population. And it was found that there are, now this has nothing to do with COVID, but this is like from uh, the years just prior to COVID, the data that comes from those years. There are, but just so you know, that the background is there are higher rates of lung, colorectal, liver, stomach, and kidney cancers in native people compared to non-Hispanic white persons. And definitely differences in the cancer rates in the six regions where Native Americans live. And most of you are probably familiar with the differences in cancer rates that exist by region among American Indians and Alaska Natives. This manuscript also described how white men and, um, I'm sorry, compared to white men, Native American men have higher rates of liver, stomach, kidney, colorectal, lung cancers, and myeloma. And as compared to white women, Native American women have higher rates of liver, stomach, kidney, colorectal, cervical cancers, and breast cancers in certain areas. And there are regional variations in the cancer rates in American Indians and Alaska Natives, as many of you are probably familiar with. For example, there are excess, that means higher than national average cancers found in the Southern Plains and also Alaska. Now this manuscript on socioeconomic racial inequalities in breast cancer screening during COVID-19 pandemic in Washington state is targeted to data just from Washington state and during COVID and focuses on breast cancer screening. And they calculated by magic, I guess, because this is like foretelling the future. This is like being a fortune teller that the decline in breast cancer screening in their state would possibly lead to more breast cancer deaths of about eight to 9.6% in the future because of women not coming for their mammograms. Mammograms fell by 49% with larger decreases in non-white women than white women, with declines by 64% in Hispanic women, and similarly, 61% in American Indian and Alaska Native women, and 59% in, in rural women. So mammograms fell by a substantial amount in that year of COVID, that first year of COVID. Additionally, there were decreased primary care visits during the pandemic. And just so you know, I, I know you probably, probably all know this, but mammography does not detect all breast cancer. It does not. And that's why clinical breast exam palpation by providers and also palpation by women themselves is important in detecting those cancers in mammograms that are actually hidden and not visible. 
So, and that is approximately one out of every four breast cancers cannot be seen on a mammogram. It's only detectable by palpation. So if a woman is not doing self-palpation and if she does not go to see her provider, assuming that provider is skilled at breast palpation, then these cancers, which tend to be large, will not be detected even by a mammogram. So visiting providers is still important in breast cancer detection and decreased primary care visits during the pandemic can contribute to especially large cancers not being detected. So this article said that the findings indicate a greater reduction in cancer screening for women, especially of lower socioeconomic status and those in underserved racial and ethnic groups and those in rural communities. And this was a interesting article if you'd like to look at it yourselves and use it. Now the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Detection Program, which I'm sure you're most of you may be familiar with is a government program that provides critical cancer screening to low income women, particularly from diverse racial and ethnic groups who would otherwise likely be unscreened, generally because they don't have funding or medical insurance to help them get screening. So, and our uh, indi an indigent population, generally speaking. Women of this group recovered to screening similar to insured women and insured populations. By June of 2020, the screening was 60% of pre-COVID levels, which was about equal to that of insured women. However, declines in screening volume, as we've talked about, may lead to later stage cancer, breast cancer and cervical cancer diagnosis and mortalities. Now this, um, this is part of the same article about the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. During COVID in 2020, breast cancer screening in this program decreased by 87%, which was pretty huge for a program dealing with indigent patients who have trouble having medical care anyway. And cervical cancer screening decreased by 84%. And overall screening decreased by all ethnicities, especially and also in rural areas, such that the greatest declines in breast cancer screening in the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program were among American Indian and Alaska Natives. Look at that, 98% and 97% decrease in Asian and Pacific Islanders, and a decrease of 84% in Hispanic women. Now the volumes did increase back again in May and June of 2020 from the dramatic drop in um, April, but still the prolonged delays may lead to delayed diagnosis and increased disparities in those already having health inequities. Breast cancer screening remained 50% lower in rural areas. So this is the program of the NBCC EDP, which you're probably mostly familiar with. And this was hugely impacted by the COVID pandemic and losing patients to screening who really need it. And uh, in the same publication, I thought it was interesting, they have the American Indian Cancer Foundation right here on the map. Did you guys know that? You're right, you're right there in Minnesota. Um, they also localized the tribes in the United States, which we're familiar with, but a lot of other readers of this article would not exactly know about. So this was a nice uh, illustration in the same article about where the tribal community headquarters are located. And this is continuing on with the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Detection Program. This demonstrates in graphic form the decrease, the dramatic decrease in April that occurred in breast services, went clear down to there. And also these were the cervical services that occurred in that program. 87% drop for breast 
84% for cervical screening. And this was compared with the five-year average of 2015 to 2019. Now this graph demonstrates in the same program, the NC, I lose track of all the letters that's in it, the National Breast Cancer Early Detection Program, Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, the, um, the decrease in attendance by the different races who use this program. So Hispanic, multiracial, American Indian and Alaskan natives in April, you see their attendance for screening in that month went down 98% compared to white women, it's pretty substantial at 87%. But American, American Indian women and Alaskan has been a huge um, problem in the native communities. And this also has affected the cancer care and cancer screening. And this is a graph that you can obtain if you go to this, this is the location of the website. It demonstrates in 2020, the COVID-19 incidents um, and American Indians are the turquoise bars and non-Hispanic whites are the purple bars. So you can see that the COVID incidence was dramatically higher. And in the same year, of course, lung cancer incidence was higher and colorectal cancer was also higher for our people. American Indians and Alaskan Natives, as I've shown you with these data, have worse COVID-19 outcomes than whites and it partially reflects disparities in other health measures. And additionally, the cancer that's out there also is complicated by COVID. COVID has caused an additional burden and challenge in the battle against cancers in our communities. All right, that's uh, the end of my talk. So let's see, I'll stop screen sharing. And let's see if we have any questions that I may or may not be able to answer, but can mostly answer any question about breast cancer screening, because that's what I do for a living. Thank you, Dr. Rubido. I think as we allow people to answer some questions, I know Hannah joined us, so I'd love for Hannah with Na uh, National Native Network to introduce herself as well. So Hannah. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I was having connectivity issues. That's our life with uh, the pandemic and Zoom now, right? Um, yeah. But we're navigating through those. So hello, my name is Hannah Bartle. I am the program manager for the National Native Network. I am from the Hannahville Potawatomi tribe in Wilson, Michigan, and I am happy to be with you all here today via Zoom. Thank you, Hannah. Hi. Um, Dr. Rubidoux again, Rubidoux again, I think that set the tone for some of the questions we have. So I think I'm going to ask our first question to Dr. Herring, and then we'll keep an eye on the chat as we see some of these questions. And again, just kind of seeing this as more of a conversation among our panelists and as we bring in questions. Um, so Dr. Herring, thinking about the presentation that we just kind of um, got a quick overview of, and then thinking about this questions, how have health inequities changed for Indigenous relatives in your community during the COVID-19 pandemic? I think, uh, you know, uh, the disparities part has always been a issue or a concern or something to be aware of. Um, so, you know, I think the, the pandemic has, you know, kind of produced some more uh, perspective on what that means in, in, in relation to inequities. I know in our work, um, and I speak only for our, uh, our region here, but I think it translates to many Indigenous communities and other communities across the country and across the world, too, is that you know, it's really important to understand um, those inequities uh, in relation to, um, you know, the services in our community. Uh, many Native nations in the U.S. have Indian Health Service. Um, and um, one, one approach that we've been taking to look at um, kind of battling against some of these inequities is to really recognize our federally qualified health centers that are adjacent to our communities. And because uh, there's a couple of reasons behind that. One is that, you know, it's always good to have good neighbors and good relationships with our neighboring communities. Oftentimes that's in a rural context as well. Um, and even uh, in some of the work that we're doing too, is that 
uh, you know, to understand those relationships through the treaties that we have, or the, in our case, the wampum agreements that we have with our um, relatives and uh, intertribally, but also among those that live within our ancestral landscapes, because we're all in this together. Um, you know, and, and the shortage of healthcare, um, 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 healthcare services within our communities, um, it's changed over time for a number of different reasons. Um, and, and not only change in the capacity of that we're able to provide services, whether it be in person, but it's also changing the capacity of how we outreach into our communities virtually to understand these multiple platforms of Zoom or Teams or, you know, all these different things that within itself is a challenge. And even the connectivity of uh, having internet access has been a challenge that we've, as a nation, all nations have overcome, are starting to overcome a little, a little better, and yet it still remains a challenge. And so, you know, part of that um, inequity is not just in the, the provision of healthcare itself, but it's in all these things combined together, and that it's really important to, to understand the inequities, whether it be in the screening or disparities, but just as a, a nation of people, as, as humans, and our relationship together with each other, how do we, how do we um, you know, create those pathways to work together? Um, and that's what we've been doing and trying to accomplish is to one, be patient uh, with that. Uh, we know it's a different pace now um, and to be patient with our uh, clinicians and those in our communities that are, are working towards screening and to be patient with understanding some of these nuances of technology, um, but that we need to kind of come together in a, a good way to, to work towards these challenges of inequities um, together and to um, you know, work together with our uh, intertribally, but also with our, uh, our adjacent communities um, that provide, because many times, and we've, we've looked at this um, in our Haudenosaunee or Iroquois communities across the Northeast, is what does that cancer care continuum look like? What are the resiliencies in that continuum? And what are the gaps um, that need to be looked at a little closer? Um, and finding, you know, going through that within our, our clinics and our uh, adjacent providers, you know, some of those nuances and things that we've discovered are, is uh, patient navigation. And so what we've been doing a little more, and I can speak a little bit more on that as we move along, but is really to engage uh, patient navigation by hiring uh, within our communities to uh, train nav navigators to work within our communities um, and also um, hiring in our adjacent rural communities, because when both of our communities are working together and both of our communities are healthy, um, that creates a, a, a better community for everyone because our patients that, and our community members that come for services on reservation reserve or territory often leave um, territory to receive care off uh, reserve in, in, in the setting, come back to territory and then may work with federally qualified health centers or other providers outside of uh, the reservation context. So we all need to work together in that. And whether it be screening or across the cancer care continuum, it's very important to understand that kind of conceptual relationships between us all. That was great. I took a little bit of notes and I think where you talked about strength and numbers and really coming together with other communities to really think about where we're at on the cancer continuum. Kathleen, I kind of want to turn it over to you and kind of hear what some of the things you're doing within the clinic um, that you're at and kind of hearing maybe some of those opportunities to network, but also, again, how is the clinic being impacted by COVID-19? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so our screening numbers for breast cancer um, was just almost exactly like um, Dr. Rubido said. Um, our mammogram, in-house mammogram that we have only had now for about a year, year and a half, um, was completely shut down there for a while because our clinic kind of changed focus into um, COVID screening and we were, people were working from home and so it was just a whole different world. Uh, I was doing uh, triaging, you know, so for just the general clinic, we all wore different hats during that time. Um, but it was also kind of, un it was strange because it was, it kind of gave me a chance to do more around the clinic. I haven't kind of been in my own little world. So, I mean, it was an opportunity in a way to, um, get my feet wet and, uh, feel like a real nurse again. Sometimes I don't always feel that way, but anyway, then trying to look back at the numbers once we were trying to get back open um 
the they initially opened up and we were only doing like four mammograms a day for several months because of the they were doing almost like a terminal clean in between patients at that time you know everybody was still thinking there was some uh, contact spread and and that kind of thing so that really kind of slowed things down we're still not back to where we were of course and um the thought of how this is cumulatively going to affect cancer diagnosis to in the future. Uh, looking at my own numbers on, you know, my small registry, I noticed that our diagnosis for cancer was completely cut in half of new diagnosis. I usually have approximately about a hundred a year. And um, last year it was uh, 50. And then breast cancer was again, half of what we had noticed in the previous years. Of course, our registry is kind of in its infancy. So my numbers are limited, but still, even from that, we can see um, such a decrease. And you think, well, those, those breast cancers are out there somewhere, you know? So, uh, but what we're trying to do as far as uh, to ramp up screening, I know the, um, for uh, the FIT kits, the fit um, piccolo cold blood sampling, they were handing those out. They did the, the gal that's doing that, our registered nurse that does that. She took advantage of the mat. We did a mask vaccination event and she felt she was able to really, you know, see people face to face and talk about the fit kits. And she had an incredible number. I think she had 56 to return from that month. And the months prior to that, she would get about somewhere along the lines of 40. So uh, taking advantage of those times when we have more people in clinic, even if it's just to be vaccinated, to take the time to advertise. And I know the American, you guys sent out a beautiful poster, um, gosh, that said, and I put that in the exam rooms, it said, it's safe to go in your clinic for cancer screenings um, along those lines. Um, but I think being able to take advantage of why the people are coming, whether it's for COVID clinic um, or COVID vaccination, if we could catch them at that time, I think that's where we're really trying to uh, get their attention and do some more one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, screening education and disinformation, uh, trying to get rid of some of the disinformation that's out there. Right. Um, great information. I think as um, we are getting a lot of questions in the chat, which is exciting from both Facebook and Zoom. So I'm going to go into this next question and I think we'll go ahead and look at some of the questions from the chat because I think they both apply to amazing conversations from the four of you. So Hannah, I have a question for you. As we think about the work that National Native Network does and isn't necessarily a clinic similar to what we do at ACAF, but what has been the most innovative or impactful strategy for outreach to educate and motivate communities to get screened? Yeah, so I think one of the main things for us here in uh, Michigan and with our rural tribal communities is social media. Social media has been huge through the pandemic for everybody. You know, social media blasts going out, you know, there were multiple social media blasts going out in various communities saying like, hey, the clinic is still open. Like we're, you know, practicing, you know, social distancing. We have cleaning practices, all these different uh, practices to help mitigate COVID that, you know, some people were like, oh, we have COVID, the clinic's closed, we can't do anything. Um, so social media has been huge with that. Um, and one of the clinics in Upper Michigan really dedicated their time and energy for like breast cancer and cervical screening uh, rates. They sort of shut down their clinic for a day and said, you know, where this is only a sort of like a women's clinic day today and we're doing these types of screening rates. We're having, you know, hour block time appointments so the women can get in and out safely. They're not waiting in line. They're not waiting in the waiting room, you know, with COVID-19 going on right now. So they really set aside a day or, you know, these separate times for these women to come in to, you know, improve these cancer screening rates and say, hey, you know, you know, with COVID-19 that we're still, you know, keeping it, yes, it's not completely on the front burner right now, but it's still, you know, within our minds to get screened um, and making sure that you feel safe during your screening is really what they did. Um, they, you know, 
gave out nice um, sort of care packages for the women's that came in. They were given, you know, like fresh flowers that day, really to just make this experience a whole lot better and feel a whole lot safer for them, even during this the scary time of COVID. Um, so they were really looking at what their community members need in each specific community and really tailoring their needs to what their clinic was going to do either that day or that week for those specific um, appointments for the women. I love that. I love flowers. Um, that's a great idea. Um, anyone else want to share any ideas, kind of what they're doing in their communities as we think? I think that's a great um, social media is a great tool for us to use and during the pandemic and even before. So anyone want to answer before I go into the q and I'll share a little bit about our uh, progress over the last year. <clears throat> Although we're, uh, our center is the Center for Indigenous Cancer Research at Roswell Park, um, we, we also have our mission statement for our center in, uh, includes through the, the advisement of our community advisory board that, you know, there's uh, other things that are very important to not only our communities here in the Northeast, but I think nationwide are, one is education um, and resources, um, but also the service part in the patient, uh, the realms of the patient and community. And so um, part of our effort to outreach in the community, and uh, we've been uh, working with Mayo Clinic for, for many years, and Dr. Rubido and I, myself have been part of uh, Native Circle and Spirit of Eagles uh, type program through Mayo Clinic. But recently, we, we uh, Roswell Parks acquired um, the Native Circle program. And what that is, working in tandem with Mayo Clinic to really uh, digitize the uh, uh, Indigenous related screening materials on resources for uh, Indigenous populations, not only in North America, but you know, for, for many people across the world. So if you um, not to give a plug to our program, but you know, if you do have the opportunity to visit uh, the Roswell Park Center for Indigenous Cancer Research, the Native Circle now is uh, completely digitized. And a lot of the material on there is uh, for community by community and has been updated and, and vetted for uh, public use. And so um, if you go there, um, we have the materials that Native Circle had through the gracious and collaborative um, effort of Mayo Clinic to really bridge that into working together to provide that resource for Indian country. And so, um, and that's part of, um, you know, the pandemic era is really understanding the virtuality of how, how to go about these things. And uh, another thing we've added, and we've recorded many of them are um, uh, webinars uh, for people to uh, review or attend. And we've had a number of speakers throughout the pandemic almost monthly uh, touching on a number of different issues and concerns or just updates from the pandemic itself to screening to to research and data all these different things that are very important to um, our communities and uh, so we've kind of brought that into the forefront of uh, the how we interact as really um, you know during that time as a virtual but now as we are starting to get into I wouldn't call it post pandemic but it's more of an understanding of the pandemic and how we are uh, engaging into communities back um, slowly in person and small groups and social distancing in that nature. So our navigators, we're very proud and we have a, a wonderful, awesome team of an indigenous, non-indigenous uh, navigator, navigators working together in our communities, slowly but surely um, getting back into the community uh, in a safe way, um, both virtually and in person, and really starting to understand these nuances because the pandemic was not just about COVID and, and uh, a lot of co-occurring conditions that um, are starting to emerge potentially from mental health uh, concerns to uh, diet, exercise, all these things are kind of, you know, we, for many of us, we've sat in front of the screen like we are now for a long time, you know? So we have to re-engage in understanding, um, you know, how our diet and exercise was before that and what our mental health was before that and what that means in a cancer prevention context. So those are all, all important things that we're starting to kind of not post pandemic, I would say fully, but kind of an understanding of where we're at and what that means for, for the future as we move forward. And those are all important things. So, uh, you know, kind of braiding all those things together and uh, moving forward in a good way and collective way is, is kind of the approach we're taking. Yeah. I look at like where we're at in the pandemic and, you know, still seeing family and friends that we're losing to the pandemic to having gotten it, whether or not they have the vaccine. And it's just, again, where are we re-engaging the importance of that vaccine while all doing this work that we care so much about dirt for cancer screenings? Um, I asked some of the staff to put the link in the 
chat to Roswell Park. So hopefully staff or attendees will be able to access that. So thank you for sharing that, Rodney. Um, Dr. Rubidu, or no, I'm gonna say it wrong one day. I'm gonna say it right. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask this question to you. It came from the chat. Um, and I think kind of from your presentation, how can we, we increase access for breast cancer screenings in American Indian, Alaska Native women living in remote areas? And then I'll open it to all um, panelists to answer. Yeah, so that's a hard question. Um, I was involved with a mobile mammography unit in the Great Plains Indian Health Service for many, many years. I don't know, 10 years, I guess, uh, 12 years. And so that was a great benefit to have that mobile unit going around to the little small clinics in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa. Um, the Indian Health Service discontinued that in 2017 because of uh, mainly complications in trying to run it with regard to having employees like truck driver and the technologist, because it's kind of a burden on those people to go around with a mobile unit in such a gigantic area. Um, but anyway, um, small areas could be served by mobile units, but there just aren't many of them. There's some in uh, Washington state. And I'm not sure what happened to the Shakopee mobile unit, but, um, transportation and access to mammography facilities is, is a problem because if you need a chest x-ray, you can go to any number of clinics that are close to you. Actually, little small clinics can do chest x-rays for everybody or, or x-ray your broken bone. But mammography is controlled by the, um, the public health service, it's a governmental control situation. And so uh, it's, you can't just have a mammography facility just anywhere, sadly, um, because they all go through multiple inspections by the federal government and all the P's have to be, or that is to say all of the T's have to be crossed or the you can't have mammography. So that's what puts the constraints on mammography is that it's regulated by the federal government and has multiple rules and multiple inspections. It's almost like the tax forms that you fill out. It's like that bad. And the only way to address patients who have who live in rural areas and don't have good access is some sort of system to get patients in vans and take them to the nearest available mammography place, for example, or to somehow fund them with transportation. Um, and it's, it's difficult for people who live in rural areas. And there, there are several articles about that topic, about the scarce breast imaging facilities for rural people where they can get their bones x-rayed and they can get their chest x-rayed, they just can't get their breasts x-rayed. Um, and so I, I don't have a solution for that yet because mobile mammography is tricky. It works. It works to take the van around, but there are very few mobile units in the United States. So what you have to do is when you have to encourage people, when you need to go shopping for Levi's in Sioux Falls <laughs> or wherever, um, or have your own Indian clinic that you go to schedule you for whatever is the nearest available mammography facility, and then try to get groups of people to go together for transportation issues. There's, there's just no other fix for it. Rodney, Kathleen, or Hannah, any other input on increasing access for breast cancer screenings? Um, we did. Um, I was just going to say this doesn't help. If, you know, with we have people in the urban area, and we have, you know, I'm thinking bus tokens or even Ubering or wh whatever could be done. But even here in the urban area, we still have trouble with transportation. Um, but I can only imagine what it's like in an urban area, like I mean, a, a remote area. Yeah. Um, but for increasing access, we did have a, back during October when it, you know, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, 
we have had in the past and um, it takes planning, but we could do, or we have done um, nighttime evening hours for a mammogram, like special nights where we had mammograms in the evening um, for those people that work or have trouble getting off. And, and um, I'm sure it could be done with like, again, with a lot of planning um, for, you know, pap smears and these kind of cervical cancer screenings to have hours that are for women that work, um, to have hours that are more, you know, later in the evening, just for special occasions and just try to drum up, try to get more people screened. Yeah, I was just going to say something similar that, you know, we have all these structural barriers that we have to get across, um, you know, like Kathleen had said about the hours, the transportation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, despite some of the huge decline in rates that we saw here in Michigan, uh, although we did see a decline in rates, it wasn't as big of a decline as we thought it would be. Um, you know, it's still in 2020 and 2021, Intertribal Council and a couple of South West Michigan hospital systems really put on the mobile mammography events still. Um, in 2020, they ended up increasing the screened rates uh, by 20% from 2019. And then in 2020, they increased the number of screened, screened women by 33% from 2019. So we did see a slight increase in it, which was really awesome, despite, you know, all of the information coming back saying like it was down. Yes, it was still down, but it wasn't as down as we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, and then additionally, they did double the enrollment of rural women in the MDHHS uh, BC3 program here in Michigan from 2019 to 2020. So that was good information to hear and good information to see within our rural communities that are still enrolling women in these programs and still, you know, getting them to the uh, screenings that they need to be at. And I'll, I'll add briefly to that too. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I'd mentioned a, a while back here was that uh, it's also important to understand some of the other resources in our communities, and that we need to work together um, with our tribes too, um, because we're all Ongwe Ongwe people. We're all Indigenous people, so our neighboring tribes may have more uh, infrastructure than um, other tribes, for example. And when we share. Um, and we've seen that here too with our nation, sharing outside of our community and then the community sharing back. So being knowledgeable of the screenings that occur in our rural communities or in our urban communities uh, may not be indigenous specific, but it's an opportunity um, to have, if, if we know times where a bus is gonna be at, to have our community aware of those times um, so they can uh, attend those events as well. So um, that's part of being good neighbors, a good tribal partners and, uh, you know, and, and our, you know, our Indian Health Service, you know, our, you know, our, our true warriors of health throughout this whole pandemic, right? They've been working extra hard and doing, doing an awesome job. But at the same time, we know it's a really hard time for them as well. So that's why I say like, you know, we need to be patient with that too. And we have to understand that and uh, be part of that um, process of, of, of how they're interacting and the responsibilities they have. And what I've seen too in our, many of our Indigenous communities that communities within the nations are stepping up too, um, that uh, community groups are forming within uh, our, our areas and to connect with the community at the community level, not so much at like the tribal government level, but the communities within themselves sometimes are a force, uh, you know, within their own context, um, having their own uh, chapter house or own community group or own um, organization with grassroots or organizations within the community are really strong allies in, in screening and being uh, information uh, givers as well. So I, I'd share that as um, just some other opportunities to work within your, your context of whether it's uh, rural reservation or urban. I think that's a great point to advocate that, you know, that it has to be outside IHS or the clinic that has to, you know, we're all advocates of our body and ensuring that everyone has access to timely screenings should be everyone's role in a community and it only makes it um, that much stronger when we all can do that. Um, another, we, I think this question came up twice, so I'm gonna um, ask this question and see if anyone has any input. I don't know if um, Marilyn, this has any, if this went back to the presentation, but, um, two questions came in. Are there differences in declines in screening among urban compared to the rural American Indian Alaska Native populations? 
So I'll open that up to all of you. Um, say the question one more time. I didn't quite understand it and I haven't seen it. Are there differences in what? In Declines screening? in screening rates among urban compared to rural American Indian Alaska Native populations. There, there's no data on that. Nobody's written about it or published, but it's a very interesting question. I would assume that those who are urban have less declines in screening than those who are rural, because most other studies show that rural have less um, screenings and less regular screenings, just in general, regardless of COVID, because they have poor, more difficult access. There's a there was an article in 2014 that showed that American Indians have the longest travel time to breast imaging of any group in the country, whether it's ethnic or any other kind of group, they have the longest travel times. And travel times, I think, are um, a predictor of how often and how much you get screening. So just being rural in general is probably for any rural person, compromises your ability to get the medical care that you need. It's a hard, oh, go ahead, Kathleen. <laughs> I was just gonna say being urban, screening in the urban setting, um, I think that what like I said, our clinic had kind of gone to a COVID testing and, and triage site and we weren't doing any, um, let's see, I, I actually spoke with our women's health um, nurse and she said from April of 2020 to July of 2020, there were no mammograms done at the clinic. And then from August of 2020 through February of 2021, we they limited to four mammograms a day. Like I said, that was when they were doing like the extra COVID precautions of cleaning and after each patient. So during that time, that's when we had the drop in the, uh, it wasn't because of the, you know, getting to the clinic or like they do in the rural areas. Um, it was just strictly because of the limits that was put on the clinic. Rodney or Hannah, any input, feedback, or I can go to the next question. <laughs> you can move on to the next question. Okay, <laughs> that's a hard one. And I know, again, that just shows the lack of accurate data. I mean, when we look at, you know, for us, that's an important comparison, urban to rural, but being able to just be included in data is always something I'm pushing and hoping that not only AIA and bring up that, but that we all are doing that in partnership um, good question here from Melissa Johnson. We at SPIPA serve a consortium of five tribes with a patient navigator at each of the tribe. One of the things we are doing to increase screenings is a safe to be seen flyer with each navigator's picture with the idea being that if the community sees a familiar face that will relieve the fear of being seen, that flyer is disseminated on social media in clinics and mail to patients. What are other ways that you folks are getting people back to screening? So kind of going back to that question again, but just anything else we're doing that um, your organizations are doing to get folks back to screening. Uh, for us, I know was a few of the points I had mentioned previous, um, you know, kind of re-engaging in person as, as much as possible. We hired a team of native uh, navigators from the community to work in the community and to work in adjacent communities. Um, and, you know, I think that's a wonderful idea. And if you have um, the ability to share a link to that uh, uh, material, it'd be, I think, great for everyone to have that, you know, safe to be screened material. And it would be good to maybe have for American Indian Cancer Foundation, as well to include in the Native Circle uh, um, resources at uh, Roswell Park would be, would be happy to review that and put that in there resources. But another approach that we've taken too is that we're in the process of making a commercial of sorts um, that we um, will be um, producing with our patient navigator team and as well as uh, 
uh, Indian Health Service units that we work with, and then the adjacent uh, fairly qualified health centers who've been very welcoming to our Indigenous team mem members to work with, and really creating a commercial about you know some of those um, uh, nuances of getting back into screening, what it means, introduction to navigation, uh, introduction to screening, the importance of a screening, and then uh, disseminating that into the communities, a commercial by the community for the community, so to say, and that um, that's another thing that we've been working on to hopefully release soon. And uh, working internally with our, both with our Roswell Park kind of media and film production team, but also community producers and uh, film and actors as well. So it's really a inclusive piece of both the community base and kind of cancer center uh, media teams. Any other thoughts on sharing ways that um, we are getting people back to screening? I can definitely go to the next. We have a couple more comments, some really good ones from um, the chat that I'll go ahead and read. Um, here's a comment from Facebook. I realize early intervention is important in breast cancer. However, why is it more education and research toward metastatic breast cancer? There's so much involved regarding loss of job, loss of insurance, side effects of medication, fatigue, loss of hair, loss of appetite, special foods, special hygiene products, depression, death rates. I am not sure anyone discusses the stages one goes through or what can happen if breast cancer metastasizes. So more a thought, but definitely open to seeing if anyone has any feedback or input on that comment from Facebook. Yeah, I think um, if you're associated with uh, a cancer center at an institution, they have um, help for people who are undergoing treatment for metastatic disease and they have support groups. If you are undergo, if you are having metastatic disease and you're at a smaller institution, like not a cancer center, then there are less resources for you, but um, there are oncologists who are very active in metastatic disease management uh, at our institution, but we're an NCI designated cancer center. But for those of you who are at smaller hospitals, there may not be as much of those resources available, although you can lobby your medical care providers where you are to start a support group that's specific to your type of cancer. So there are breast cancer support groups, prostate cancer support groups, and so on. Then one should be started because having a group and having your own community who have that situation in common would be a wonderful psychological benefit and resource. So it kind of depends on where you are as to what you have access to. But if you don't have any, I mean, look at the nearest adjacent larger city and see if you can find through maybe the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, you may be able to locate a breast cancer support group in your region, if not your hospital. I, I will agree with that. You know, um, you know, even the, the link that's been provided through the Native Circle has a lot of information that, that can be useful. Um, and I agree with Dr. Rubido about you know uh, advocating. You know, what is the strategic plan for the cancer care continuum um, at your tribe, organization, or cancer center? What does that look like for um, survivorship? What does it look like for prevention? All those things are important. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to ask those questions too, and I, you know, and on this, uh, meeting here, there's probably a blend of providers, community members, and perhaps some other cancer centers and ask yourself, you know, what is the, what is the strategic plan for American Indian Alaska natives at your own institute, at your own tribe or your own organization? And does it include, um, the question that was asked about, you know, yeah, things that have occurred, you know, after being diagnosed and what does the survivorship plan or treatment plan look like? And how does it, what does it look like for natives? 
So those are all good questions. Um, and, you know, we should be included in that conversation, especially in the, uh, the NCI designated cancer centers, we should be included in that conver conversation. And there should be a strategic plan for us um, at, at every cancer center across the US. So it's a good question to ask. Kathleen or Hannah, any thoughts as kind of some of the work that happens in your communities as we think about survivorship and being in active treatment? <clears throat> yeah, um, some of the things that just come to mind is, are the cancer support groups and some of the programs that we put on, even you know, with Intertribal Council and some of their sort of under the umbrella programs that we do. Um, we found that like the support groups are really helpful, whether they're you know, meeting, you know, via virtually or, you know, when it was safe to meet, you know, safe to meet in person, they were meeting in person and really just sort of creating their own community within the community of, you know, any at any stage of their journey, whether they're in remission or whether they just recently got diagnosed or whether they're sort of like in the thick of it at the moment that it really helps to have the stories from women at different stages in um, the cancer care continuum. I was just going to say that, you know, it is good a uh, statement because you have to be very mindful when you're in a support group or when you're facilitating a support group, because people are, you have to remind people, some people have had surgery and there's nothing else. They don't even need chemo. And they're so excited that it's really, it's very, you have to be careful that there could be somebody sitting next to you that is metastatic and, and there is no surgery for them or, um, or the talk of being cancer free, that's not realistic. And so everybody is at such a different place in their journey. And uh, it's good to have uh, individual organ specific uh, support groups and, and some always being mindful that everybody is going to be at a different stage in their journey with cancer. So uh, yeah, it is a good statement. And I included a link to one that is specifically for metastatic. Um, breast cancer. Yeah. Thank you. Great feedback input. Um, I want to ask um, staff if I answer if we got to all the questions from our audience. I will double check. I'm going to go back to the questions we had kind of talked about that we, um, the six questions <laughs> that we were going to discuss. Um, I think these two are really great to think about. Um, so how do you think the Delta variant and future variants could impact cancer screenings in our native communities? And I'll open that to all, all panelists. I think it's really making us think on our feet um, and really sort of thinking outside the box of what we're going to do with each of our communities because our communities are so different, whether they're more rural or urban. Um, it really is sort of, we really have to tailor each clinic or each um, sort of healthcare center to that community and what the rates look like around, um, even in the surrounding counties or surrounding areas. And I think that we are really, um, I don't, coming up with new and innovative ways to get people back into our um, clinic safely. Um, so I, I think it's really challenging us as community members, as healthcare leaders. Um, it's really showing sort of a mirror of what our barriers are, you know, even pre-COVID. And we really have to think through those now to really get the safest possible um, care that our community members can get. I, uh, I agree with that. And I also think about like, uh, we've learned so much um, about how to interact with not only a cancer screening, but just life in general, you know, and all these things that we uh, um, are learning throughout that we need to continue practicing. And, you know, and how, um, how our screenings or healthcare in general, um, can be part of that process now. And I think we're at a better place than we were in the beginning um, because we weren't even allowed to leave the house for quite some time, you know? So now we're starting to re-engage, but we have the knowledge. You know, we have the resilience. We have this, you know, not only Western knowledge, but indigenous knowledge that we've reacquired in, in many aspects 
that we can, you know, remember, we have to remember that every time we leave, leave out the door, that all that knowledge that we have, we have to remember that as we walk through our communities and other communities, um, the importance of that. And that certainly plays into how we walk into our health centers and our screening and, and not only for us, but for our elders and our children and what that all means in that process of healthcare. Um, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things around not only the, the Delta variant, but there's a lot of other things that we have to be cognizant of um, around us that are equally as important. I was just going to say, I think um, with the Delta variant and children and in native uh, households, is the multi-generational aspect of it all uh, becomes really into play when you're talking about a, a, a disease that's so contagious. And now with the children and um, in, in many native households, you see so many different generations and it's just even more frightening and needs to be considered more than it would in a non-native, I believe. Well, we have about 10 minutes. I have one more question and then I see one more question came in from the chat. Um, are there any known diseases that are passed down in tribes that stand out? I'll jump in on that one to start it off. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, in regards to uh, disparities, so um, sometimes the disparities and diseases are different um, among different tribes because there are over 550 fairly recognized tribes in the US and over 500 bands in Canada and EWs in New Zealand who are indigenous. And so, you know, there, you know, there may be some uh, similarities like uh, diabetes, for example, um, among uh, indigenous people. And perhaps that's related to obesity, which may also have some relationship to cancer in some cases. Um, but I think that, you know, disparities um, really are different between regions. Um, there are some, I would say, um, diseases or disparities that are um, seen in many indigenous communities that are same or similar. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to say that maybe it's like one disease that is passed on from tribe and within a tribe may may not have like a uh, there, I don't I don't think there's one that really like is a disease of a of a people, but uh, some of the health disparities that exist there are similarities and there are a lot of uh, things that may contribute to that whether it be uh, the changes of life lifestyle through colonization and Western food um, uh, compared to ancestral foods or change of uh, ancestral uh, life ways and exercises to the change of uh, ancestral medicines to modern medicines, um, along with, uh, you know, genetics and all these different other things that may come into the, the play of uh, disease states. So the answer is, uh, I don't think there's one answer to that, but I, I think there, you know, I do know that there, depending on the region, um, there may be, for example, if there is a greater smoking uh, prevalence in a certain region that may have more effect on how um, lung cancer is for a certain tribe, for example, in that region. So it, a lot of times it's environmental context and that nature of, you know, how people uh, live in that particular area. So um, I think everyone should look into their family history and try to find out diseases that are in your own family regardless of um, whether native related or non-native related. Uh, for example, I know when I was young, my grandfather who was native um, had a stroke when he was 62 and was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And it was due to hypertension that was uncontrolled in those days. And then when I was researching genealogy, I, I came across his father's death certificate. 
who was also native on the Iowa reservation, and his father had died of a cerebral stroke as well. From And then this is generally due to high blood pressure. And then uh, I myself was diagnosed with high blood pressure about two years ago. So I've been trying to control it. And then um, surprisingly, my 42-year-old daughter four months ago had a stroke. And that presumably was from hypertension. Um, she probably knew that she had it, but she was in denial. She did not want to have a disease, right? And so I think she was either not taking her medication or ignoring it. So she had a stroke while she was asleep and um, has been partially paralyzed because of that. And this, so this goes back, what, that's like four generations of people with hypertension. So pay attention to what's in your family and take steps to deal with that, whatever it is, whether it's cancer or heart disease or brain disease, you know, just note your family history. Definitely want to give prayers to your daughter, Marilyn, and her healing and her journey. Um, that's scary. That's my age. It's scary to think about. And I think definitely knowing your family history, I know ACAF has a um, family tree that we've you know created to really find that and see what some of those cancers are, or other diseases in your family, and it matters. Um, so again, just prayers for your daughter. Um, I will end with this one question and then I think we'll be able to close up as we got about five minutes. Um, what has been an aha moment for you personally or for your clinic organization during the pandemic when it comes to the needs of your community? I think sort of an aha moment for me sort of personally and as it relates to the work I do, um, was my tribe in particular, they are um, rural upper Michigan. They are, you know, really rely on social media to get a lot of their word out, whether it be through the uh, general clinic, general tribal operations, through the uh, school that we have on the reservation. They really rely on Facebook to get the, that information out to the people the quickest. And I was informed over the weekend that they had um, sort of legal work done and legal um, jargon and whatnot to go with um, poss a possible HIPAA violation, but they were getting information from the clinic to their patients via Facebook Messenger because that was the fastest way and the best way to communicate with their people to get information, whether it be uh, screening rates, um, COVID tests, follow-up appointments, or any sort of information that they needed to get out quickly. And they saw huge improvements within the communication that between the clinic and uh, the patients. So I thought that was a really sort of aha moment of the, again, the power of social media through this, um, times that we've been navigating through. I think for us, it, it was, uh, you know, it may have been like a, a startle at the beginning of the pandemic. And, uh, and you know, it, for us, it was a chance to really uh, be that uh, courageous person and, and team to really uh, move forward, to continue on on the things that we, uh, we needed to do. Um, and uh, whether it be as a researcher, as a a service provider, a clinician, um, but just a person, and really engage our team in uh, creating a good mind on what that means to work together. And for us too, it wasn't just us as our Indigenous Center, but it was us as our um, partners interdepartmental uh, within Roswell Park working together to address um, concerns of Indian country. And it was us as external partners like ACAF and others. And and I think, you know, working together in that way um, was really an aha moment that we didn't, uh, we didn't stop for very, we didn't pause for very long. Uh, we found creative uh, ways to, to learn what, you remember in the beginning, nobody knew what Zoom was. So we had to train really fast and what that meant and how to find connectivity and the, these uh, buttons on these screens and cameras and all these different things. But a lot of us in the field, we didn't hesitate. You know, we, we really worked together um, and we found uh, 
creative ways to to move things forward and uh you know it may have been a, a global pandemic but for us uh it was really a time to be creative uh to to help our relations and we're thankful for each and every one of you being a part of that process and uh, we we've done our, i think uh, the best job we could do so maybe that's kind of a global aha but you know that's something that really uh emerged and our our center grew from one to many or a few to many um, during the pandemic and so it wasn't a period of a stalemate for us we really grew our, our navigation center arose during the pandemic and that's just a, a, a testament to what we can do as a collective working together so i appreciate every, everyone in that process Well, I just want to say that I think for our clinic, it was uh, uh, just we're all in this together and not just the clinic, but I mean, we had to see uh, non-natives come in to get their vaccinations at some of our mass vaccination uh, events. And I don't know, it was just a, a feeling of it, it, as bad as it was, it was a good feeling um, to see everybody coming together. We have a huge homeless population in this urban area as well. And to see the, the native patients that could come in, you know, sometimes they'd have shoes and everybody in the clinic getting together. Do you have any shoes? Do you have anything in your car? And it would never fail. Somebody would say, I've got, you know, I've got a pair of boots or I've got, what size are they? You know, and it was such a good, a warm feeling in, in the face of something so tragic and awful to see people, uh, you know, I still believe that people are, are good. And, and I think that really did, uh, that was proven to me many times during the pandemic. And, and that was a good thing to see. Marilyn, any thoughts? I see you're off mute as before we close oh. up. <laughs> I'm done. No. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we ended on a really good note. It was good to hear all of those aha moments and share those and to see how well we all came together and working together. I think we all, all five of our organizations have wonderful resources and, you know, doing the best we can for our communities, both urban, rural, frontier. So I just want to, again, thank you, Marilyn, Rodney, Kathleen, Hannah, for sharing your expertise, for your knowledge, for, you know, sharing this space with all of us today. Um, I do just want to, um, we have a survey in the chat, hopefully it's in Facebook too, again, you know, completing surveys like this help us improve our work and the work that we do and the messages that we get out there um, as we work to address the cancer continuum during a pandemic. So with that, I thank you all for your time. I hope you all have a wonderful and beautiful blessed day. And again, I'm thankful for all of you today on this call. Thank you. It's been an honor to sit on this panel with all of you. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Pilamia, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.